Good afternoon. My name is Pradeep. I teach chemistry at the Department of Chemistry here. On behalf of uh, IIT Madras, on behalf of uh, the Dean of International and Alumni Affairs, IIT Madras, and on behalf of Purdue Alumni Association, let me welcome you all for this, this meeting, this lecture. Uh, this is the first lecture of a series of lectures that Professor Graham Cooks is delivering. The first one is here, the second one is in Bangalore, then he is going to deliver another one at Ahmedabad, and subsequently one other thing, but it's not under this edges, it's uh, at Mohali, Aysar Mohali. Professor Graham Cooks is uh, our distinguished professor, and he is... Uh, also, uh, well, he has been a distinguished professor at Purdue University for a long time, since 1990. He received his PhD, two degrees, one from University of Natal, South Africa, and another from Cambridge University. His interests involve construction of mass spectrometers and their use in fundamental studies and applications. Very early in his career, he contributed to the concept and implementation of tandem mass spectrometry and desorption ionization, described the very first matrix-assisted ionization experiments, invented new MS scans, including multiple reaction monitoring, you commonly refer to as MRM, and built hybrid instruments. His interests uh, in mini uh, minimizing sample workup and avoiding chromatography contributed to the development of the ambient ionization methods, including desorption electrospray ionization, DESI, thus now branched to become several tens of techniques now. Well, he has uh, gone on to miniature mass spectrometers and their applications to problems of trace chemical detection, mass spectrometers, backpack mass spectrometers, and things of this kind. He is, uh, he is a mass spectrometrist par excellence. Wherever you go about, uh, people talk about ion chemistry, mass spectrometry, this is the name that figures in most of those discussions. Graham Cooks is uh, a past president of the American Society for Mass Spectrometry and the International Mass Spectrometry Society and a life member of the British, Indian, Chinese and uh, uh, of Mass Spectrometry Societies. And he has won awards of the Royal Society of Chemistry and the American Chemical Society. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and he recently won the Treffers Prize in Chemical Sciences. Uh, he has um, been the advisor of 128 uh, PhD students, and uh, his students are all over the world. Uh, his science has contributed to four incubated companies. Well, what is written here in his, P, in his brief resume is that he advised two to the power seven PhD students. Uh, his science has contributed to the development of many techniques, as I just mentioned, contributed to several millions of dollars of revenue every year for mass spectrometry companies. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Cooks with us. He has been with us for several days now. He will be with us for a few more days. And he'll be coming again. He has a joint student now uh, at IIT Madras. And his student at Purdue is, uh, has just landed here this morning. He will be here with us for two and a half months. You will have more opportunities to interact with him. Please uh, welcome Professor Graham Cooks. So thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction. Um, 
One of the nice things about uh, being here this afternoon is that uh, Pradeep was a postdoc with me for some years back, and uh, the kind of associations that are developed in a lab last for a lifetime, and they actually become better and better with time. So I greatly appreciate my interactions with you, Pradeep, and admire what you've been able to do uh, here in Madras. I'm also very proud of the fact that I can write my address the way I, I did departments of chemistry at Purdue University and IIT Madras. I've, I feel it's a signal honor to me. And uh, Dean, I'm very glad to see you here in the audience. Appreciate that. So what I want to do this afternoon is to talk about the subject of measuring molecules. And I'm going to try to do this in a way that recognizes the fact that not everybody in the audience uh, cares at all about mass spectrometry. Uh, that quite a few people in the audience don't care about chemistry, uh, and so I'm going to try and reach as many people as I can in, in this talk. I'll, I'll just start by saying in an introductory way that measuring molecules is something which is part of everyday life for all of us. So we're bathed in a sea of molecules, molecules that we make, molecules that are internal to us, molecules that are part of the fabricated environment. And for all those reasons, we need to know what those molecules are. And this is a huge, complex task. And it's one which up to now has been done in a fairly haphazard and a relatively inefficient way. And those two statements, in fact, are key to the rest of this talk, that I don't think people have measured molecules well at all. And the task ahead of us in terms of measuring molecules is enormous. And we're going to have to become much better at it. And so what I'll try to do is to show some methods that have the potential to make this a whole lot easier than it is at the moment. OK, so the other thing you'll notice on the first slide is that I've used three colors. Of course, there's a white background, so I won't count that. So I've actually used two colors. The colors I've used are black and gold, black and old gold. And so at this point, since this is a Purdue-associated talk, I'll just emphasize that those are the Purdue colors, and this was not an accident. And given that, the next few slides will represent something of an introduction or a reminder for those of you who have spent time at Purdue uh, about this institution. So there's a little bit of an introduction to Purdue here, as well as the other stuff. So at least this could be interesting to non-chemists. OK, so this is Purdue University. This is Mike, who just uh, landed. And uh, here he is in, in, in the lab working on a, a mass spectrometer. Um, this is Amelia Earhart, uh, who was based at Purdue and, uh, in fact, was funded by the Purdue Research Foundation at a time when they had more money than since uh, to fly around the world. Um, this is a clock tower, uh, obviously. And as our former president said, any institution that doesn't have a clock tower isn't worthy of being a university. So he had more money than since when he put that up, because all it does is hold a clock. Um, this is another object which holds stuff. This is actually in the engineering uh, building, the main engineering building. And this is the Apollo capsule uh, that was flown uh, to the moon. And it's hung high above. You can see people walking down here. It's hung high up there for, I think, two good reasons. One reason is that this capsule flew. And so you need to look up in order to see the capsule. The other reason is if you hang it sufficiently high, nobody can fool with it or paint it or otherwise damage some historic relic. Um, and this is, this is a, a boilermaker, which is this, the school motto. Uh, and he's making boilers. OK, this is West Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, it's a tiny town. Um, most of what you see well, out in this picture, I think pretty much everything you see is the university. Um, the, the, the center of the picture, unfortunately, is where the teams lose most of their games most of the time, 
which is the football stadium. Um, and there's a basketball stadium out here where the, the scores are usually a lot better. Um, but much more importantly than that, over here is one and over here is a second chemistry building. And most of the rest of the buildings at Purdue are engineering buildings, which I, I think at IIT Madras is probably what you think there should be a lot of. So the, in terms of international dimensions, um, this is the total enrollment uh, in terms of Indian students, 700 undergrads and somewhat more uh, grad students. Um, international students, 24% of total uh, enrollment. Uh, this is a fairly high number, a very high percentage actually, in most, most places, probably second highest in the US. In terms of innovation and what's happened on this campus over the last uh, 50 years or so, uh, this is the founder of Purdue. His name is John, John Purdue. Um, and physics for a long time, and then subsequently biology, which is represented here as well, uh, was the, the, the centerpiece of attention. So a great deal of important work on semiconductors uh, was done at, at Purdue. Uh, Lark Horowitz is a, a well-known name. Uh, Al Overhauser, a physicist at Purdue, um, and his uh, name is attached to the nuclear Overhauser effect, which I think people will recognize. Um, Michael Rossman, a virologist who uh, did the first structure of the common cold virus as well as many other uh, viruses and is still going strong in that area. Uh, Herb Brown, a synthetic organic chemist who is uh, famous for his work on organoboranes. And one of the most interesting things in the present context about Herb Brown is that almost his entire research group were Indian. Uh, he ran a research group which was 90% Indian. Uh, I think there was one woman in the entire period that he had a research group and there were a few uh, Americans. So that tradition continues. Um, we, Jay Malash is the scientist responsible for the deep impact probe. Um, we have uh, high-speed uh, biological imaging, uh, Xinjiang Cheng, uh, Andy Weiner, who's involved in data cloaking. Uh, we have a number of groups that are involved in drug discovery. At, at a couple of years ago, we had more drugs in clinical trials than a couple of the major pharma companies. So we've put some emphasis in, in drug discovery as well. Oops, wrong direction. This is our president who visited here a couple of months ago, Mitch Daniels. Uh, and this is a little bit about, and I put this one in because of an interest in startups uh, here with IIT Madras and uh, in Chennai in, in, in general. So we've had a research park at Purdue for almost 60 years. Uh, there's 150 companies, almost all the companies are based on Purdue patents. And in 2014, there were 24 startups uh, and 20 million in new funding. I guess that goes into those startups. Um, 156 patents last year, and uh, the Purdue Research Incubator was the incubator network of the year. So these, most of the companies are in West Lafayette here, um, but there are, in fact, Purdue uh, Research Parks. Uh, all along I-65 um, between uh, Chicago, in fact, and Evansville. Purdue is sometimes called the cradle of the astronauts uh, because there have been 23 astronauts uh, who have been Purdue grads. And those have included these people, Gus Grissom um, over here, who was one of the Mercury 7 astronauts who was unfortunately killed in the in the fire on, on, uh, uh, at uh, Houston. Um, Eugene Cernan, who was the, the last man uh, on the moon, and Neil Armstrong, the, the first man on the moon, uh, who was a Purdue grad and um, 
who's represented in a statue here, which is outside of Armstrong Hall, which is the main engineering administration hall on campus. So these are some Madras expats. Uh, Suresh Garamala, who's our executive VP, uh, who uh, is an IIT Madras grad. He was here a few months ago. And I'll, I'll leave you to, to read the other names. This is not a complete list. It's, it's what could be grabbed in a, in a quick grab. So of course, there's space at Pradeep. I'm putting you up here. There's people that have spent significant parts of their careers at Purdue. So we're pleased with all of you and proud of you. Some people we're, we're proud of as well then would be Anant Ramdas, um, who's the Lock Harwitz Professor of Physics at Purdue, and um, Raman's last student. And um, he's spent his entire career uh, at Purdue and has been recognized for his work in spectroscopy, not surprising. Um, and then H. Nagishi, who uh, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago. And um, C.N.R. Rao, who is uh, a Purdue PhD, of whom we're extremely proud. So turning from the general situation at Purdue to the chemistry department in particular, and I'll say this because I say it at Purdue, uh, chemistry is kind of a middle ranking department at Purdue. We're not as bad as the humanities, but we're not as good as engineering. So we know where we stand. So uh, engineering is, is, is pretty much king at Purdue. Uh, chemistry is trying to get there. So these are the areas we emphasize. We emphasize instrumentation. We emphasize, in the chemistry department, drug delivery, uh, energy, synthesis, and materials. And we have a faculty of 55 people, and so we could go through and uh, do a cross matrix of all those people in, in all of these areas. That would not be interesting. Um, Coming back to startups, these are chemistry department startup companies. Um, one of them was some time back. All of the rest are actually ab about a decade or less. And in fact, there's a couple more that I don't have on here. So there is certainly a tradition in the chemistry department. In fact, it's soon to be a requirement for tenure that you start a company. Not quite joke, but uh, it's going that way. So a lot of people have done it, but there's also serial startup people. So Rainier is a couple of times, one, two, three, Kissinger, two, and so on. And in terms of the size of the department, we may not be excellent, but we're, we're good and large. And uh, we're, in fact, the largest PhD producer in the United States uh, at the moment. Um, having recently overtaken Berkeley. Um, and then you can see some of these other places that you may recognize as large departments, whatever subject you'd be talking about. What we are good at is analytical chemistry. So we're ranked number one in analytical chemistry, and we intend to stay there. Or the other places, North Carolina, Illinois, and Texas, Austin. Okay, so that's my introduction to, to Purdue and the sort of the, the background to what I want to talk about. And I hope I've told you a couple of things that are interesting, but also I hope I've shown you that instrumentation is a key part of what we try to do. So now I'll introduce myself modestly um, and tell you a little story which will form the basis for the rest of this talk. Okay, so I was a PhD student at one point, and I was given a job by my advisor of taking some plant material, and I've spoken with a number of people here in the last couple of days who were doing exactly that. Here is some plant material, here's some biological material. 
what's in it. Can you discover what molecules these are? Well, that was my job. But it was done at a time before there was mass spectrometry anywhere except a couple of places in the world. It was done at a time before there were most of the techniques that we rely on now. There was a little bit of UV vis and there was a little bit of IR, and that was all there was in the way of spectroscopic techniques. So if you had a sample that you wanted to characterize, and hopefully it was pure, uh, what you did on the sample is you did chemistry. And if you did chemistry the way I did chemistry, you just made the sample worse. You didn't convert it from A to B, which is what we wrote on the board. A, of course, is an unknown. You converted it from A to B, B prime, B double prime, B triple prime, and so on. So it, it wasn't a sensible way of solving a molecular structure problem to subject the molecule to chemical reactions, but that's how it was done in those days. And with, through the skill of chemists, that was sometimes successful. It was actually often successful, but it was hugely painstaking. So my PhD project was this species, a mangrove tree, the leaf of this mangrove tree, actually the bark of this tree. And the question that was asked was, what is it? And if you could find out, you were pretty sure to get a PhD. If you couldn't, you would probably have to go into writing literature, which was really what I wanted to do anyway. So this is where I lived. Um, and I've been back a couple of times, and it's actually picture perfect still. And so I often wonder why I left. And the way I proceeded was to get a chainsaw, a biologist, and a Land Rover in order to cut down the right tree. Got that tree back to the lab, debarked the tree, got eight kilograms of bark, pulverized that bark, extracted it with chloroform, and then started to do chromatography. And this was the beginning of my hate relationship with chromatography. So much of my career has been devoted to trying to get rid of chromatography. It's obviously not been successful. Chromatography is doing pretty well. The chromatography was done on a 25 centimeter diameter column, like this, eight foot column. And we poured literally gallons of solvent. And in the, the final thing we did the solvent with was benzene. And so it turned out, in fact, that benzene was a really good solvent at the end of a day of working with plant material to get rid of the chlorophyll from your hands. Rural men didn't use gloves. You used your hands, and you washed your hands in benzene. And I understand that benzene's tied pretty closely to bladder cancer. Um, so we did that, and in the end I got 1.5 grams of impure alkaloid and proceeded to do this chemistry, oxidize, took, took a third of this and oxidized it. Okay, so now it's oxidized. What is it? Well, it was pale yellow, but now it's a pretty deep yellow. And I have no idea. I didn't have a UV that I could see. So then I took another third of it and reduced it. Zinc reduction, zinc dust reduction. No clues at all. Now, so it's the last 0.5, 500 milligrams, a lot of material now. It wasn't a lot of material then. Um, and so w w what are you going to do to this? I think the only successful thing I did chemistry was to expose it to the pine bark resin test, where you dip it in, uh, dip some pine bark in hydrochloric acid and then hold it into the sample, and you get a particular color if it's a pearl alkaloid, a parole. So that, that, that worked. So then this guy came and gave a speech on this, which is a birth control pill. Um, this is Carl Gerasi, who had just invented the birth control pill and was uh, popularizing it by going to, around the world giving lectures on birth control, which were enormously popular in those days for reasons I can't understand now. Um, and so he gave a big lecture at Purdue on steroids and birth control. And in the course of that, I gave a response. One of the students had to respond, and I gave the response to this lecture, which basically said nothing, except made a couple of comments about fighting on the beaches for birth control. That was the theme. Um, in the end, he took back to Stanford a small amount of the sample and 10 days later, 
So this involved a flight, the same distance between Natal, South Africa, and Stanford now and then. The speed of that part of the journey was about the same. Of course, mail no longer exists. You can't send a sample by mail. You can't. Uh, you, of course, you can do email. So the whole thing. Anyway, 10 days, I got the structure back. This is the structure. There's a nitrogen there. There's a nitrogen there. There's one, two, three, four sulfurs. It's a bis-disulfide, two disulfide bridges. It oxidized very readily. In fact, it went to the disulfonic acid. It reduced very readily, went to the dimercaptan. I didn't recognize any of those products, but Maspec gave the answer. So this experience then raised a question for me. Can chemical analysis be made faster and simpler? Because I almost became a poet because of failing to get this thing to work, which I, I essentially did fail. I was saved by Maspec. And a, a, couple, a few years later, I, I think I found a part of the answer in tandem mass spectrometry. So in tandem mass spectrometry, which I'll tell you about now in a little bit uh, of detail, you do mass spectrometry twice. You take a sample and you do mass spec and you get information if it's a pure sample. If it's not a pure sample, then you can separate out components of that sample so it's a kind of chromatography, except it's not chromatography, it's just separation. You separate the ions instead of separating the neutral molecules. And then you dissociate the molecule, and there you run the mass spectrum that tells you what the ion was. And if you ionize it gently by, say, dropping a proton softly onto the molecule, then you'll have the molecular structure. So tandem mass spectrometry, MS for mass spectrometry, MS. So MSMS. So that experiment allows the direct analysis of complex mixtures. And I had a complex mixture. And so, in fact, to many, many people since. So this is the experiment. Ions are used as surrogates for neutrals. This is your problem. You've got a complex mixture consisting of many molecules, and you wish to identify those molecules. Maybe all of them, maybe just some of them. What do you do? You don't work with the molecules. You convert the molecules gently into ions so that each ion has the same structure as the original corresponding molecule. So this is called a soft ionization method. The common example is to put a proton on a molecule. So now you've got a protonated molecule. This set of ions can easily be separated with a mass spectrometer. Of course, you could, you could take this mixture, complex mixture, make your ions and record a mass spectrum, do mass analysis. If you did that, you would get a pretty bad looking mass spectrum. This is what you would get if you had a really complex mixture. This is a real mass spectrum of complex mixture of fly ash. So there's hundreds and hundreds of molecules. You can't tell anything about any individual molecule. You would have to do separation. And traditionally, what you would do is you do chromatography. So you take the fly ash, dissolve it up, separate it out. Three days later, you would be able to do the mass spectrometry. That's far, much too slow. So instead of that, we separate out the individual ions, which have the same structure as the corresponding MP molecule, dissociate that ion into a set of fragments, then do the mass analysis. So this is the MSMS spectrum. And the spectrum that's just been replaced had very poor signal and no information. This spectrum is rich in information. And this is, in fact, a trichlorodibenzodioxin. It's a dioxin in fly ash. And we get the structure immediately. So this experiment, this MSMS experiment, um, gradually became a major experiment in mass spectrometry. Most of mass spectrometry now is done at least with use of the MSMS experiment. So you can do it in a number of different ways. You can take a particular molecule, dissociate it, and look at all of the products. That's what I've just shown you. Or else you can take one of the products. This is a very efficient experiment. You're not doing any scans. You're characterizing a molecule not just by one ion, but by two ions, or three or four, do a sequence. And this is the single reaction monitoring or MRM experiment that uh, 
Pradeep mentioned in the beginning, multiple reaction monitoring. It's a good way of quantifying molecules in complex mixtures. So because of these capabilities, we can go back into the field and we can find these hairy cactus, for example, and say what's in it. And this is an experiment we actually did. So what's in this particular Pachycereus weberi? Pachycereus looks like an elephant. And this is what's in it, or at least this is partially what's in it, a whole lot of alkaloids that you can structurally characterize. So this vindicated my PhD experience and said there are easier ways of doing this. So let's ask a further question. What we had to do in the experiment that I just showed you was we still had to dissolve the, the sample of interest. Uh, so for example, we took hemlock the same thing that Socrates used, and tried to look at the compounds in hemlock. And what we did was to take the leaf material and extract it, put that complex mixture on a probe, put it in the vacuum, and record the MSMS spectrum. So we're doing direct analysis, but we weren't doing it in the easiest possible way. So we were doing tandem mass spectrometry. We were looking at a complex mixture, but we were not working where we really want to work, we were not working with unmodified material in the open air. And so this next development, the ambient ionization, which is just 10 years back, solved the question of working on complex samples in air without any sample workup. And this is what I want to show you some examples of now. So real samples and this is a point maybe that in discussions, particularly with engineers who love sensors, because the sensor is something that magically turns some system into information. It does. It, it usually tells you the pH or the temperature. You've got 10 million organic molecules. There's no sensor that's going to solve that problem. You need an instrument. You need a spectrometer. And in particular, you need a mass spectrometer. It can be a simple one. It can work easily, but it can't just it, there's no yes, no here. We're asking a complex set of questions. So real samples, I'm going to emphasize this for later, are spatially and chemically complex. Spatially and chemically complex. So in the real world, what do we want to do? We want actually to make these kinds of measurements on real samples, whether they're water samples, sewage samples, biofluid samples, whatever they are. And that is being done at the moment by mass spectrometry at more or less, right now, mass spec is a $30 billion uh, activity, $30 billion a year activity. Chemical analysis is a $300 billion activity, and it's growing for something like 14% a year. It'll probably end up by growing a lot faster than that, because most things are not being analyzed. Most fruit is not analyzed. Most food is not analyzed, and so on and on and on. Most people being treated for cancer with drugs are not analyzed. The, the, the physician, of course, does the usual blood workup, and two days later there's some information. There's a huge, huge gap. So there's a huge amount of chemical information that's needed. This chemical information, the most high-performance version, and in mass spectrometry, it, maybe it's this, it's multi-stage, iron mobility, MS, 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 and so on million dollar instruments, they're, they're going to be in a very few places. The real work is done down here. This is where the rubber hits the road. A little chip-based mass spectrometer, uh, clearly something portable, something chip-based, something instantaneous to make the many, many measurements that individuals will want to make that have to be made in all sorts of locations. So this triangle represents the path by which we're going to do the sorts of numbers and quality of chemical analysis that need to be done. So the ambient ionization sources are part of the answer to this part two. How do you make measurements on real samples in the, without preparing the sample? And we've developed over the last couple of 10 years or so uh, three versions of this, but I'll really just talk about one, this DESI experiment. So, the sample, an ordinary complex sample sitting here, is sprayed with solvent. And what happens is that droplet of solvent extracts solution through the splash process, carrying these secondary charged droplets to the mass spectrometer. 
the solvent evaporates and you've got your sample. So the sampling is done just by spraying solvent at a surface at the sample. So this whole process takes milliseconds. There's no sample workup. It's done in the air. This is an ambient ionization experiment. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to show you a variety of other examples of what you can do with ambient ionization with Jersey. OK, you can go to the airport and you can look at the luggage. So instead of having the dog, this is my grand dog. I'm his grandfather. Well, I'm not actually legally his grandfather, but I'm considered the grandfather of the dog. And he's a Purdue dog, and he's lost his job, which is why he looks the way he does. And the reason he's lost his job, because the mass spectrometer has taken over the job. He has to rest every 30 minutes. And so we've got a DESI mass spectrometer, and there's RDX on this suitcase. There's 50 femtomol. We get a spectrum like this. It takes five seconds, and you've got an answer. So what it has taken 10 years to begin this year for the first time to get these miniature mass spectrometers into airport security. That is a ridiculous amount of time, because the science hasn't changed at all in the last 10 years. But that's how slowly society works. OK, what else can you do? You can go for, you can have a suspected case of a strep throat. And when you have, when you go for a, the standard procedure, the rapid strep test, gives a result which is about the same as tossing a coin. And so they don't take any action based on the result. They take a culture anyway. They grow the culture and they let you know in two days' time if your child had strep, strep throat or not. That seems a silly way to do it. If you want to know if a child has got strep throat, then you should identify the bacterium for strep throat, streptomyces, at the time. And one way to do that is to use the same cotton swab that's used normally and to put a solvent on that, hold it in front of a mass spectrometer, and you'll get a pattern which is characteristic of streptomyces or not characteristic of streptomyces is yes, no. Or else you can consider another example. If you go to Holland, one of the places you'll probably visit is a coffee shop, or certainly if you go to Amsterdam. Coffee is a, a, a misnomer in this circumstance. They don't mean coffee. They mean other drugs. And so if you go to a coffee shop and then you start driving in Amsterdam, you will probably be stopped, you might be stopped, for random drug test. And the new Dutch law requires that there be uh, nine compounds that you meet certain level of uh, in, in terms of the, the cutoff level in nanograms per mil. This is PPM. Um, and these, um, I'm sorry, this is PPB. Uh, these levels are whatever they are. It's 50 for all those compounds, 20 and 3 over here. And we're using this experiment that I'm telling you about. You don't have to know too much more about the experiment to solve this problem. So here are the solutions. LOD, the lowest limit of detection, well below 50, below 20, and below, well, we just about hit it, 3.53. Um, and the relative standard deviation is perfectly acceptable. So this is not a qualitative experiment. It's not an experiment that says, well, OK, maybe you got it. Maybe you don't have it. It's probably going to work out to be legally fully allowed. So this is done by an experiment called paper spray. And it's working out very well. And what does it involve? It involves taking um, 5 microliters of solvent on top of 12 microliters of blood. So this is a, this is a test of blood, which is much more reliable than urine. How much blood? 12 microliters. 12 microliters? What do, you, what do you usually take when you go and have blood taken? 12 milliliters, yeah, more like. So it's a pinprick, in other words. Let's see if there's any more. If you go to the grocery store, one of the things you may want is you may want organic vegetables. How would you know? The non-organic vegetables and fruit is much cheaper, so why don't you just buy that? Well, if you do mass spec on this, and if you do this ambient ionization mass spec, 
and you sample the organic material, this is the mass spectrum. There's lots of compounds on apples, for example. The non-organic, there's extra compounds. So you pay less and you get more. You get thiobendazole, imazolol, and in fact a couple of other uh, agrochemicals just thrown in. And you can see them immediately and you can confirm them and you can quantify them and this is all in a few seconds. There's another one that you may want to do. If you're concerned with the quality of petroleum in a high uh, large distance transmission line, you've got crude oil going through a line and they protect the stainless steel. These are these huge transmission lines that run across Saudi Arabia and other places. They protect the steel by throwing in organic compounds, quaternary ammonium compounds, one is shown here. And they have to test whether the quaternary ammonium compound is still present uh, after some period of time. Otherwise, the steel corrodes, the oil corrodes the steel, and you've got the petroleum running into the desert, which is where it came from, so maybe it should really go back there in any the case. And so how do you find out? You take a drop of the petroleum and you put it on a piece of paper, you apply a voltage, you record a mass spectrum. This mass spectrum tells you that there is quaternary nitrogen compound, tells you how much there is as well. Well, the last example, this is work we did with uh, Pradeep and Hermanta, um, looking at uh, camptothesin. So the, this is the classic case, complex mixture. What do you do? You're going to do MSMS. We already know that. But you're also doing ambient ionization, these two things. So you just spray against the bark and you get a mass spectrum. This first mass spectrum doesn't tell you too much. But certainly when you take MSMS, you get characteristic information and you can identify this compound. And then the last example, uh, looking at therapeutic drugs in blood. Uh, people undergoing cancer uh, therapy, imatinib, for example, for liver, liver cancer. This is, uh, you, you need to get the blood levels in this range, this therapeutic range, and those measurements are not made because it takes too long, so they just give the drug and wait for the patient to respond or not respond, or to have an incident, and then they turn on all the lights, they run in, and they try to revive the patient. This is just normal, everyday cancer anti cancer drug therapy. It could easily be done by monitoring that blood with paper spray experiment um, all the time. Okay, so here we are. We've done ambient ions, a tandem mass spectrometry in order to make chemical analysis simpler and faster. We've done ambient ionization simpler and faster. Is there anything else that we should do? And my last section really deals with what else we should do because a real sample is going to require direct analysis because it will be a complex mixture. A real sample is going to re require ambient ionization because you want to examine it where it is, in air. And a real sample is going to require imaging because it's spatially diverse. So you, you need the spatial information that's necessary to describe an actual real sample. So real sample, spatially and chemically diverse, and sensors don't cut it. Okay, so here's a real sample. It's a drawing of a cat on a pillow or photograph of that thing. And we're going to try and analyze the cat on the pillow. So we're not going to do chromatography because we would dissolve the cat. And, and we're not going to do spectroscopy because we already did it. This is the spectrum. This is, this is the spectrum. This is a picture of the cat. So what are we going to do? We have to do mass spec. That's the only way to find out anything about this cat. So. We take a mass spectrum in the tail, we take a mass spectrum on the ear, we take a mass spectrum on the snout. We get all these different mass spectra. Each mass spectrum's got all the information on all the chemicals on the tail, all the chemicals on the snout, all the chemicals on the ear. We can reconstruct that and draw a picture of the chemical 443, whatever that chemical is, and then show in false color the distribution of that chemical. You can guess that chemical was red, so this is a red dye that was used in the painting, but there could be lots of other colors in this. You see the point. And then we can represent the cat in false color, and then we've transferred information from stage to stage to stage. <clears throat> so
So there is the picture of the house or the cat or whatever it is, and we're doing this DESI experiment, spraying point by point by point, grabbing a huge amount of data, reconstructing that data, and learning all there is to learn about that sample. Well, we could do it on a fingerprint. Here's a fingerprint. This is an ink print. Here's a real fingerprint, because there's nothing to see. It's a latent print. So there's a distribution of whirls and swirls here, which you can't see unless you do an experiment like this DESI experiment. When we do the DESI experiment and plot the results for one chemical, we see this. We may also have another chemical, which is only on the tip of the finger and so on. We can see all that information. That was, by the way, in CSI. Somebody was saying before that CSI doesn't work like that. Well, in this case, it does. You can hold the latent fingerprint under the DESI, and you get, you get the answer, and you identify the, the suspect, as they say. OK, so what we get out of this is we get a lot of information, but we, we need to process that information by all the methods. I'm thinking of engineers. I'm imagining you're all engineers. So we have all these methods of processing this information. And so we do training sets, test sets. We've got a model. We do the validation. We cross correlate that. And we end up by this tissue, we say, by definition, has to be normal. And this has to be abnormal because of uh, what we've gone through with some independent method. OK, so we now come to the heart of the matter. We've got the set of experiments that we can apply to a worthwhile problem. So we're going to try to do that. What's a worthwhile problem? It's brain cancer. So if it's true that we can get a distribution of the chemicals in, in space without doing any sample workup, learning from the MSMS experiment, then this is a great problem to work on. So if we were to take a region of the brain or a tiny piece of brain tissue and run a mass spectrum just on one region, we might get a spectrum that would look like this. And this looks exactly like, not exactly, looks like some of the lipid spectra that we were looking at earlier today with some of Pradeep's group members. There's some lipids over here. This is, for our purposes, these medical purposes, this is just a pattern. It's a pattern which is similar or dissimilar to a whole lot of other patterns, which an expert, a pathologist, tells us that's a particular kind of brain cancer. It's a particular stage of the disease. If we take a section of tissue and repeatedly take mass spectra, we can look at the distribution of a particular compound. This is phosphatidyl serine compound and it's high in the cancer and it's low in the normal. But we're not trying to distinguish cancer and normal based on one molecule. There's no such thing as a, silver, as a silver bullet. So what we can hope for is to use the distribution of a number of different molecules in order to do the diagnostics. So here's the experiment taken a little bit further. This is an H&E stain, the kind of stain that's used for biological tissue. And this is a surgical sample. It's astrocytoma type of cancer, brain cancer, grade 4. It's a high grade. Um, and there's heterogeneity here. And there's also, in this particular spectrum here, we see a difference. There's a large area which, in which there's 750. And there's an area where there's none of that iron. There's an area here where there's 788 and none of that iron. But we're not going to try and interpret that way. We're just going to look at the entire pattern and base it on comparisons with libraries. OK, so this is a story that's involved a collaboration with the Harvard Medical School, uh, Natalie Agar and her colleagues. This is the surgical suite at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Um, this is the surgeon that we worked with. This is how they do this kind of brain surgery. But mostly by using high quality optics and looking at screens all the time. Uh, the patient is usually awake in these surgeries uh, so that the patient can guide the surgeon in terms of critical areas. Um, and the complexity comes from this. There's 125 types of brain tumors. They're difficult to diagnose. It's easy to use MRI and to say there's a tumor. That doesn't say very much at all about what type of tumor there is. And survival is low, as most people will know. Uh, there's a, a great deal 
uh, of remission, m many, many cases, substantial fraction under, of patients undergo remission in a couple of years. Uh, and the critical decisions are made during the neurosurgery. So what's needed? It's intraoperative diagnosis of tumors and their margins. It's all the things we've been talking about for silly problems like drugs in Amsterdam applied to a real problem, and a, a real decent sized problem, which is this brain tumor problem. So you need these diagnoses, you need them instantly, or at least you need them in a very short period of time. So I went to one of these surgeries, and I can tell you it took 20 minutes to get, during the, the course of one of these surgeries, a, a four-hour surgery. Well, there was preliminary stuff I wasn't for, so probably six altogether. One experiment is done. Everything else is just uh, experts doing things that they're expert at, like guessing. That we'll take a little more tissue over here, we'll do this over there finding out which regions of the exposed brain correspond to uh, critical centers by having the patient say, can you, can you, if I stimulate in this region, can you feel it? Putting pieces of paper on the brain to mark left finger, right knee, little colored L, F, R, N. The brain has got these little pieces of paper on it. This is an area that is badly in need of medium tech science. It's got high-tech optics, it needs medium-tech science, and it needs it really quite quickly, and it's probably going to come quite quickly. Um, so this is, this, was the, this is Natalie, this is the grad student, um, Livia Ebelin, who was involved in a lot of this work, and Alison Dill, who worked um, actually prior to Livia doing some of the preliminary work be before we got as far as getting into the hospital. So, this is, these are mass spectra, which nobody cares to look at except the half a dozen people here who love mass spectrometry. And these are different grades. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, they're different subtypes in the same grade of uh, astrocytoma. And there are differences here, which we can't make sense of, but which a pathologist can make sense of. But what you can see, a mass spec person, and anybody can see there's differences in these distributions. These are highly reproducible spectra. They're the same every time. And so you can compare with a library, you can get answers that are reliable. And that's shown here. This is using a classifier, dividing them up into different types of astrocytoma, oligodendroma, and so on, uh, in grade two, grade three, grade four. Uh, the percentage of that and then the concentration of tumor cells. So divided up pretty fine in terms of the type of tumor and what's involved. And then the success rate for this overall was uh, 90%, something like that. And in fact, some of the errors may well have been the pathologists who don't always agree with each other. So this got to the point where you could take a region of interest in a section. So this is the tissue section. This region is going to be examined. And then just by applying these numerical methods, you would classify that region. So this region in that tissue, sample G26, is grade 4 astrocytoma. Um, and so it's astrocytoma here, and it's grade 4 entirely. That's that classification. And another sample is a mixture of astrocytoma um, and uh, oligodendroma and grade two and grade four, the region between. So in practice, what's happening now is that during the surgery, you can take the way they take a sample to go to pathology is they take a smear, they smear it between glass slides, send it over to pathology. 20 minutes later, they get a phone call on a single sample. So we, we can put a mass spectrometer in the surgical suite and do that experiment as often as the surgeon has a question. So the surgeon will actually do the mass spectrometry because all it involves is taking a, the, the section, tiny little piece that he's asking or she's asking a question about, putting it on a glass slide and then spraying it and doing the comparison automatically with a library of spectra. 
Okay, so that's enough of that. This is looking at different regions inside the, the skull. Um, and these are little samples that have been taken and analyzed the way I just mentioned. So the, the last statement I'll make, because I think it's getting late, um, if we're going to be serious about doing the, the molecular measurements that need to be done, then we can't take samples back to the lab. So what I've been talking about is putting a mass spectrometer in the surgical suite. That's true in the airport. That's true in the hospital point of care. It's true almost everywhere. So the old way of doing things can't continue. But also, there is no need at all for a high performance instrument. You, you can have low performance. The surgical uh, experiments did not require high performance at all. They require quite low performance. So for a while now, we've been building miniature mass spectrometers in an attempt to be able to resolve these problems. So here's a miniature mass spectrometer. Here's a house. Here are some things we've been looking at. So here's the garden, the grass in front of the house on which people spread chemicals for no good reason. Um, this is day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, looking at the poison that they've put on their, on their grass outside their house so their children could enjoy playing on the grass, I suppose. I don't know that's why they do that. Um, this is a miniature mass spectrometer. This is a version of an instrument. Um, Paul Hendricks built this one. This is, she's got the sampling region in her hand. This is what she has on her back. These are mass spectra that you get with this tiny little thing. It's this big, this cut three inches, 10 centimeters. This is cocaine. This is the MS, MS spectrum of cocaine, MS cubed spectrum. This is all you need. You, you, you don't need uh, high resolution, high performance, million dollar kind of mass spectrometers. These things should end up by being very cheap, very simple. You go to the grocery store with them. I'm not gonna show you the video. When you go to the grocery store, you shine this thing on an apple, you see a mass spectrum that tells you they put this toxin on the apple. The reason is they didn't want the brown scald on the apple, right? So there's an environmental question as well. It's a question of educating the public. Do you want a little bit of brown on the side of your apple, or do you want it shining at you and reflecting your image in a, in a bunch of chemicals? I mean, it's, it's so straightforward, it's not funny. And your mother told you to peel the apple, and so now you do an imaging experiment where you cut the apple and you spray across it. You find a lot of the stuff on the skin or just under the skin. But you also find a lot in the center, so your mother didn't know about this because she didn't have a mass spectrometer. And of course, you can look at all sorts of things. So the combination I've been talking about is tandem mass spectrometry. You, you know exactly what you're looking at. Uh, ambient ionization, so you can do the experiment out in the open air without working up the sample, and miniature mass spectrometers so that you can go where the, where the question is. And this is a summary of all of that, so tandem mass spectrometry, ambient ionization, miniature mass spectrometers, and the ability then to uh, apply science and technology to the question of chemical measurement. I'll just put up at the end then a picture. Oh, I thought it was going to be a picture of the research group. It would have been a picture of some of them, but they wouldn't all fit, so I won't have any. But I'll just say that I'm very uh, much indebted to the people I work with. Thank you very much. You might have some questions. Yes, it is complex. We, we're extracting whatever we'll extract into a drop of solvent from the swab. And so if it's, if it's a mixture of several microorganisms, we see the spectrum, the, the sum of the spectra of the two different microorganisms. But it's not normally like that. It's normally just one major bacterium. And Does it really help in diagnosis? We'll see. We're doing a clinical study at the moment. So I mean, we Oh, yeah. But it does, in the lab, we can distinguish several streptomyces species and certainly distinguish from other kinds of... Uh, so if I had a pure strain of strep... Yeah, you get a characteristic spectrum yes, every time. I can see that. Yeah. Whether it's protein or liquid or... No, it's lipids. We, all of these experiments are done by lipid analysis. There's, How do you make sure there's no... We don't care. 
We, we get a mass spectrum. If we, we, we don't even look out in the region where the proteins occur. We're looking up to about 800 molecular weight. So the proteins are not there, but they're not, they actually don't come off. We're, we're basically, the solvent is an organic solvent like methanol water. We're not pulling off proteins efficiently. So you're looking at the lipids? Well, we're looking at whatever shows, which is mostly lipids, yes. But we, you know, this experiment most doesn't really depend on identification of the molecules. It just depends on there being a molecular pattern converted into ions. Which is a signature. It's got to be reproducible. And you've got to know, a lot. you've got to have a library of particular microorganisms. And yeah. what you're saying is that there is reproducibility. I'm, I'm saying the reproducibility is spectacularly okay. good. And that had to be true for the brain cancer work as well. Otherwise, that, this, this experiment wouldn't work. <laughs> if, we don't like proteins because there's so many people working on proteins. No one was working on lipids when we started. It's just a really nice area. Yes, but uh, you know, five years ago, people would have told you that lipids were not diagnostic. Now it's turning out that lipids are at least equally diagnostic, maybe more diagnostic. So what you're saying is proteins are not diagnostic? Um, well, I'm saying it's not necessary to look at proteins. It's much easier uh, to look at lipids. Yeah, Yes, you, would, you wouldn't use this method, you would use a, another method. The best of those methods involves using a laser, so now the thing has become more complex and more expensive. And you would use a matrix, you'd use the method which is called MALDI, Matrix Assisted Laser That's Desorption. It. That's it. That's it. Not for protein. Oh, well, it depends on the molecule. Depends entirely on the molecule. You know, so, in, I mean, this is a game that people play, and you end up by reporting the best that was ever found. It's like, you know, Everest is 29,002 feet. So, it, so you report that. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Most mountains are not 29,002 feet. So I, I, don't, I think it's very misleading to give numbers like that. I, I'm not trying to cop out. I mean, we've done atograms, but it's, it, it doesn't mean very much. Shout. Go ahead. Behind Van. Can you tell me what they found in the tissue? Yeah, the tissue work was originally done with a mixture of methanol and water. Um, that. So these droplets actually are moving with reasonably high velocity, 100 meters a second. Um, and that was causing some physical damage to the tissue. And we wanted the tissue to be undamaged. And so we started using uh, organic solvents. There are several of them that can be used. Um, DMF, for example, with appropriate mixtures. And those actually lift off the, the lipids, give the same spectra that you can then take the tissue and pass it on to a pathologist, and the pathologist won't see any morphological differences. In other words, it will be undamaged, un quote, undamaged tissue. We're, we're using lipid profiles to identify complex systems, which, which include systems which are bacteria, uh, just tissue and the health state, we, we're using those profiles also to look at compounds in, in blood, for example. Yep. No, it's not, it, it's, not just, it's not just healthy and diseased. Um, in the brain, I showed you some cases where we were, we were able to tell the stage, the grade of the disease. So it's, it's not just black-white. By no means is that the only thing we're doing, healthy and diseased. You can do much more subtle. And that's because the, there are uh, reproducible differences between the profiles. Well, one thing that you didn't talk about was the synthesis. Yes. Um, would you like to? Yeah, you want to wait another hour, and I'll just tell you about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I didn't talk, because there wasn't time. Um, in those droplets, if you, if you provide a mixture of two compounds, for example, I'll take an example from work in Pradeep's group that we're being talked about today. Um, if, you, if you do a shift base condensation reaction, if you take an aldehyde or a ketone and an amine, uh, you can form a complex and then you can dehydrate and you've got the imine. So that's very simple, straightforward organic chemistry. Uh, and those reactions can be done, for example, in an undergrad lab um, by taking this mixture in the usual way. Uh, well, what you do is you put on a white coat and then goggles and then you feel a lot, a bit more like a scientist. And so you stand by this bench, and you turn on the heating system. It used to be a Bunsen burner. It's not allowed anymore because you may burn something. And uh, you cook this thing for an hour. This is why organic chemists' cars or bikes or motorcycles are usually outside of chemistry buildings long after everybody else is gone, because they do nothing most of the time. But the reaction is doing itself. And so they need to be around. And so they got into this habit of spending 18 hours a day, quote, working. They're actually not working at all. The reaction is, is, is working. So it's become a way of life. It's sort of a very comfortable thing to do, to be working all, all the time. It's lead, led to innumerable divorces. The sociology of organic synthesis is one of the more interesting things around. Anyway, that could all change because instead of do it taking an hour or maybe more like three hours so there's time to have a cup of tea and then come back to the lab and so on, um, you can do these same reactions in these micro droplets under accelerated rate. So if you take this mixture of this aldehyde and this amine and you spray that mixture and collect the product, then these little droplets are evaporating and you collect the product and lo and behold you've got the imine in your hand. And if you do that on a time scale of a few milliseconds, you've gone up by a factor of 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4 in the rate of reaction. So that would be a nice way to do chemistry or even to teach chemistry because you could do an entire semester of organic synthesis in an afternoon. And you would learn a whole lot of chemistry while you did that, and you would not pollute. This is what he wanted me to tell you, that you would not pollute anywhere near as much as being polluted right now. And you would use much less in the way of chemicals. So all of these, these reasons. But you, the, the bottom line is, yes, you can synthesize milligram scale quantities of lots of simple organic chemicals. And we've tried this out on undergrad labs. And the students like it because it's quick. Without coats. Yes. Yes, you don't have to wear the white coat either. Where did this come from? Sorry? Where did the heat come from? No, no heat. It's actually things get cold. As you spray, it evaporates, and so cooling occurs. So there's no heat. The rate of reaction goes up in spite of the cooling. Um, well, the droplets start on the micron, maybe three micron scale, and they end up, if they keep evaporating, which they do by the time you've collected the product, they end up on the molecular scale. And so if you had this base, and it's protonated, so we're going to work at pH 5, say, you've got a base, it's protonated, you've got a ketone, so you've got these two molecules which are going to eventually react while you go and have tea, right? But if you remove the solvent, evaporate, 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 then you've got an ion and a molecule and no solvent to stop them from reacting. So solvent is really the way in which organic synthesis ensures that there are long tea breaks because these things react immediately. Huh? Well, it's it's the lack, it, yeah, it's the lack of solvent that's stopping reactions. Yeah. Swati, so you had a quick question. Sir, you mentioned that the solvent used is the methanol 
water, mostly it's a population. How does that affect, affect us? Um, well, that's, that's all, those solvents ex are good at extracting lipids, but it doesn't have to be. You can use chloroform, if you like, that extracts lipids as well. You, wouldn't, you, you need a solvent that's good at extracting, and you need a solvent that will evaporate nicely. That's but all. mostly we see that combination being used. Yeah, it's water. traditional. It's not. It's, you know, for, the, for this tissue work, we don't use it anymore. So methanol water is not used now in the tissue work. But it's, it was a traditional solvent in uh, electrospray, yeah. Well, uh, uh, what Professor Cooks did not talk about was this long journey uh, of what he talked about from synthesis, from isolation of a compound by cutting a, a large a trunk, extraction followed by chemical analysis to, to mass spectrometry. And today's miniature mass spectrometry and ambient ionization, it has been a very long journey of ions. In that long journey of ions, uh, there are many things that he didn't talk about. Ions gave us information about structures. Ions gave us information about thermochemistry. Ions, the ions gave us information that chemists all branches of chemistry and biochemistry appreciate today. Many of them, uh, he has himself contributed to immensely. So it has been a, a great journey through the chemistry of ions, the chemistry of, um, well, chemistry through ions, and that is what he has exposed today. There's more to come because chemistry is synthesis, structure, and properties. And some time ago, we thought ions were telling us about analysis. But today, ions are actually making those compounds, those very same structures you analyze later on. So chemistry, the central aspect of chemistry, ions are going to play a very important role in the years to come, which is synthesis. That is what uh, he talked about at the very end. Maybe new kinds of synthesis, maybe new kinds of molecules, new kinds of things which you couldn't access sometime earlier. The very last bit that he didn't talk about was also synthesis leading to structures, nanostructures especially. And that has a lot of uh, things uh, before us not just synthesis of some shapes, but also, well, structures, but also shape control, synthesis of structures. That would lead to catalysis, that would lead to many other phenomena. So this chemistry is, is opening up, and uh, which, has, which is sort of a becoming a highly interdisciplinary area of activity. It's a pleasure uh, to, to see this enormous growth of this area. I've been fortunate to be associated with at least a portion of the science. One thing that I didn't mention in the beginning was this enormous generosity of this individual. When I came here, I had almost nothing, almost nothing. And many of the things that uh, his laboratory had the properties, materials, many of them ran my laboratory here. So I'm immensely grateful to those little small things, gifts that I got um, from, from which uh, a tiny laboratory got nucleated here. It became something substantial today. So it has been a pleasure to be associated with you. So on behalf of uh, IIT Madras and on behalf of the Purdue Alumni Association, and also on behalf of Professor C.N.R. Rao, who also uh, is part of this organization of this event, may I request our dean uh, to come on stage and present a memento on behalf of the institution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you then. Thank you all.